In our other teaching, we talked about the four classic perfections of Scripture. That is the authority, the necessity, the clarity, and the sufficiency of Scripture. And if we're going to start talking about the most fundamental pieces of doctrine and theology, we have to talk about really how do we know who God is. And I want to, um, I want to say more about the necessity of Scripture and I am, I want to teach you that there's an absolute necessity for scripture, an absolute necessity, not kind of, it would be nice. It's an extra add on. There's so many ways that our culture um, doesn't take seriously that we have to have an absolute, we have an absolute need for, of to have a word from God a word that we know we can stand on, a word that is not man's word, it has been corrupted by man. It has, that it has an infallibility to it. And so it's utterly trustworthy because it hasn't been, it has been monkeyed around with or doctored or used in some other way for some other man-centered agenda. And so um, the way I wanna get into this subject, it's it seems a little bit, it may seem, um, um, you know, the, you, you may have ob some obvious understandings of why we have to have a necessity for scripture, which is like, for instance, there's sin and, and because of sin, there's always other unholy kinds of agendas whenever there's a word about God proclaimed to the world, even inside the church. But um, I want to talk about the absolute necessity for scripture from the, from the perspective of ontology. Now, what does ontology mean? <laughs> ontology means that which we are in our most fundamental being, that which is the very fundamental stuff of reality. So um, what are you in your very existence? That is what ontology is. And when we're talking about ontology, we're talking about, we're talking about the very nature of God himself. So I want to, I want to, um, I want you to understand that we have an absolute need for a revealed word from God for scripture because of who God is, because of the very nature of reality. And I want to say, just let me say a couple things in, um, in this brief video. Number one, um, human beings regularly, deeply underestimate that you need to have a word from outside of the system, <laughs> that God himself must speak into our minds, our history, our lives. Human beings regularly think that, you know, we just assume reality as we perceive it and that reality as we perceive it is sufficient and that we can come up with our own, in our, we, uh, with our enough own wisdom, our own science, our own morality, uh, for, from our own moral intuitions, from our own traditions, from all of the history of all of the wise people of our times and of our culture, we can figure out how to get through life. And um, the Bible's perspective is no way. <laughs> and I would say history's judgment is no way that all of the empirical evidence of history is that human beings are incapable of getting to a real and deep and profound and sustained vision of living life in the truth of God, apart from a revealed word. So, um, but it's at the, at the most basic level, but human beings regularly today regularly assume otherwise. We assume that you don't, that scripture is nice, but we can get by without it. Even Christians, even Christians regularly have our very secular worldly attitude that I have to have wisdom about money. I have to have wisdom about my job. I have to have wisdom from my parents or from my culture or from, and then the wisdom from God, the word from God, the truth of God is somehow even Christians often is like, well, we need that for, and then we, we tend to put that into some kind of like, um, privatize or into a box. This has to do with religion or salvation or sin or church. But when it comes to going out into the world of how are we going to live and how are we going to know God and live inside of the knowledge of God, you know, we regularly just, you know, we tend to keep the, the Bible in its own, you know, kind of like quiet corner. So even Christians very often deeply under, un, underestimate the absolute necessity for um, a revealed word, the scripture. And so I want to just get at first, um, in order to do this, you have to have some handle on the doctrine of God. You have to have some handle. And I want to give you a first kind of like 
uh, some, some important concepts that you have to get in order to get the most fundamental view of how big this being, this person is that we're talking about. And that's, that's the, that's, I want to say two things um, in, this, uh, in this video. Number one, in order to understand and start to deal with uh, who God is, you have to first understand that we have to have an important distinction. The theologians wrestle with the fact that there is a person, the who of God. And then there is a being, the what of God, the very stuff or nature of God. This is what I mean by ontology. What is God? What is the very being of God? <laughs> and so we're talking about the who-ness of God, the person. That's the way generally Christians, if you believe in God, you pray to him and you have a personal relationship. Mostly we're dealing with a person and we're interacting with the person and we are thinking about the who of God. But I want to you to shift gears a little bit now and think about the what of God, the whatness of God, the being of God, the ontological nature of God. That's the that's the the theological language of this. And I want you to start to wrap your mind on what God is, the being of God. And if you can get some idea of how infinitely great he is and how infinitely above he is, I mean, I want to, you know, um, this is a first pass to help you to begin to put your mind into it and then put your heart into it. This space that before God, you know, you probably already have this idea that he's so much bigger than us, he's so much greater than us, but that really your mind and my mind, no matter how brilliant or how smart or how knowledgeable you are, we are but like a puny nothing that is utterly incapable of receiving the bigness of God. And so I want you to begin unless he reveals himself. And so, um, uh, so first, here's the first concept, the person of God and the who of God and the whatness of God, the being of God, or as I'm calling it, the ontological nature of what God is, right? Second thing I want to say before I wrap up this, uh, this uh, intro video is that in the very doctrine of God, uh, the way you went to get at the whatness of God, what is God? <laughs> the way theologians talk about the being of God is to talk about his attributes, God's attributes. What, when you're going to describe what is the attributes of something, like let's say we're going to, so let's just say, what are the attributes of iron? Iron is a certain kind of substance. It, uh, it, it's hard, it's tough, it can be molded, but it is strong. It has certain attributes. What are the attributes of water? Um, it's made of you know, two parts, hydrogen, one part, oxygen. And at certain temperatures, it behaves in certain ways. It has certain attributes. What is the whatness, the ontological nature the, of the stuff, of the whatness of God? And theologians have two big categories of attributes. And they are, briefly, they are the incommunicable attributes and the communicable attributes. They're the incommunicable attributes and the communicable attributes. The incommunicable attributes are the attributes of God that he can communicate to, to it's communicable to others. So think of like a disease, you know, we're, we're in the middle of a, of a pandemic. Um, some diseases are communicable. That means you can get it you can catch it. Some are easily caught, like a cold or a flu, or you know, uh, or um, you know, this uh, this COVID nineteen virus. Some it's not so easy, but it's still communicable. And some diseases you can't. It's not communicable. A person has it, and they can't give it to anybody else. The attributes of God, some He can give to another created being. Some of those attributes He can give to another created being, and some are his and only his and he can have. Those are called the incommunicable attributes. And the ones he can give are called the communicable attributes. And let me just give you a basic description and we'll end to this, uh, this teaching. The communicable attributes are, are, are things like justice or love or righteousness. We can have some measure of them because we don't have them to the extent or to the greatness of God, but we can share in those attributes, right? But the incommunicable attributes are the ones that make God, God. The ones that we tend to think of, this is what makes God utterly different and, and really quite frankly, incomprehensible and so much infinitely greater than us. 
So they are like the attributes of, um, of, of, of uh, God is eternal. God is omnipotent. God is omniscient. And I would like to get into um, one of the attributes of God, and I want to give a special video on one of the attributes that the theologians have called his aseity. And um, that one, most people haven't really ever thought about or recognized, and we'll get into that one. And this will help you get into some idea why we have to have, um, an, why there's an absolute need for a revealed word from God in order for us to know him and know the truth and, um, of God in a sufficient way so that we can actually walk with him and have a relationship with him, okay?